there would be five groups and you'll self-organize the different tables into uh, according to your color or according to no stickers. Um, and then we're going to go through a rapid evaluation framework, which will be applied to the case study um, as it applies to legal workflow. So we'll get started. Um, uh, okay. Thanks, Amy. Um, hello again. Um, so before I get started, I just wanted to ask, um, now that you've had an opportunity to maybe digest it a little bit, were, were there any questions or observations or you know, other thoughts about the anchor use case that, that we put forward, that I put forward at the beginning of the day? Commercial purchase and sale of goods and applying that as a way to evaluate the legal dimension of what's happening transactionally with blockchain technology. Okay, not hearing any. Um, so, why blockchain stands out in an introduction to smart contracts? So, Clicking doesn't work sometimes in an introduction to web browsers. Oh, here we go. Oh, something's happening. Hmm. Could I trouble you to help me navigate to this um, URL? Thank you. So I, what I I put together a a short um, so-called block uh, briefing for for lawyers on blockchain. Ah, thank you. Very good. And this is um, it, it, to start with. Um, I wanted to just break down some of what what Matt went through at a high level. We went through some of the math and some of the high level, almost um, structural or architectural views of, of the blockchain technology, but um, he, he used a number of words in there that um, I think probably bear um, a little further demystification. And it's also a way to um, start to look at, um, as, as Amy kind of named the session, like why does blockchain stand out? What is so unique or different or important about it? So the very first thing is that it uses hash technology. Okay, so I'm going to sit down here. So this little demo, which you can um, you can grab at law.mit.edu, um, shows basically literally how a SHA, which is a um, secure hash algorithm, SHA-256 hash works. And again, the the purpose of this algorithm is what I would call from a more legal perspective, message integrity, or, um, or creating some evidence that the that data has not changed since a certain point in time. So I'll put some data in here. Or actually, can any, anybody tell me some word or phrase to type? And we'll start with that data. Go ahead. Okay. The answer is 42. So it is. Now we'll go around the universe to find the question. Is, <laughs> right, that's Douglas Adams. Um, and so this is a hash, um, 54E5C, of exactly that information, um, that data, those characters, 
Okay. Um, so notice how it's this um, basically alphanumeric string. And um, if if I were to let's just say that this data were a trade secret or a contract or a um, you know whatever any bit of data that was um, a bill of lading uh, that you wanted to um, lock down, say for purposes of provenance or to create and preserve evidence that something happened at a certain point in time, you could apply this hash algorithm to it, and you would get the same exact string length, but a totally unique string of characters. So um, notice how if I add even one number to this, say 422, totally different string emerges. So if I were to email you the answer is 42 or, or put it in a plain text document and you apply this algorithm to it, it's an it's a, a open uh, standard. Uh, there's lots of open source and proprietary software that lets you apply the exact same algorithm. You would get, as a result, 7A3, AA, B9, et cetera. And so um, that would tell you um, that the data hasn't changed. Assuming the hash of data hasn't changed, then there's nothing in the data that's changed. You could put the Library of Congress or all the works of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, you could hash that. And if you change so much as a comma or added a space or introduced any change whatsoever, again, you would get a completely different string. But notice that the string is the same length. This is a very elegant algorithm, okay? So even if I had, you know, gigabytes of data, I would still get the same length string. Okay, so that's one rudiment. And the way just building up here a little bit, the way that looks, this is a somewhat simplified and streamlined, but basically applying that in a blockchain, let's say this is block one of a blockchain, and I added the data, um, the answer is 42. Um, what this is doing in the block, now that we've introduced the concept of like a, um, you can think of it like a page in a ledger. We have um, one data element, the answer is 42, and we add that to two other data elements, uh, the block number. So we're kind of tying now the transaction or the other information in the block to a block number. And this interesting thing called a nonce, um, that, that's basically, uh, in blockchain, um, the nonce is added to, well, this, so when, when Matt referenced that there's proof of work or there's um, mining that happens, um, literally what, what they're doing when they're mining, and I'll just click this button, well, first of all, notice the hash right now, 1C4913, and notice how it's, um, how the block is read, and that's because um, I um, added some information to it. If I take this data out, we'll go back to the original screen. Ah, okay, now it's colored blue. So the hash of one and 72608, when you hash those two data elements, you get this result. If you add something to it, you know, if I added a piece of information here, we just coded this so that it changes the, uh, the color to red because that does not create that hash, if I add information here, get a different hash. If I mine it, basically what this process is, is um, going through a calculation and asking what is the lowest um, number I can add to the nonce field that will get me a hash that starts with four zeros. <laughs> um, you're probably wondering what the heck is that all about? Because uh, it sounds like a very peculiar puzzle. Um, it is a peculiar puzzle, um, and um, there's a certain amount of computational difficulty to basically um, add to the non say you know uh, n put the number two in and then hash it and see does that give me a hash result in the bottom uh, field that starts with four zeros? No, it doesn't. How about number three? No, it doesn't. In this case, it it the the script behind this. Uh, process 296,443 different numbers, just adding one each time before it found the first um, number when added to the answer is 42 and the number one for the block number that results in a hash that starts with four zeros. Because this is somewhat computationally intensive to go through all of those processes, um, we call it proof of work, okay? And that, that's pretty much what's happening with, um, with mining. 
you can, um, and from time to time, the the, um, the bar is uh, modified. It's a little higher, a little lower, usually higher. Um, to um, so, if if the question was, how, what's the first hash that would result in five zeros? It would be a much larger number. It would be much more computationally intensive. Okay. So that's a little something about mining, and that's um. Let me just say, uh, so something more typical in a in a blockchain would be um, Alice, uh, you know, uh, transfers um, one coin or token or something to uh, B, and then maybe another one is um, A transfers um, two coins. To see, so maybe you know, we've got two transactions in this block. We mine it, and dum de dum de dum. Okay, um, seventy one thousand six hundred fifty five is the first number when added to the number one, and those characters, those two transactions, we'll say in the block that will give us a nonce of uh, four zeros. So now let's um, add the chain concept. That's a block. What, what about a block chain, M Matt? Um, Sort of referred to this, but let me break it down more simply and more explicitly. So this chain here, we've got block one, block two, block three, and again, just conceptually, you can think of each block as like a page in a ledger or some arbitrary range of transactions in like a ledger. Um, um, all of these have been kind of pre-configured to start with four zeros, and these nonces reflect that. So one. And this number, 11316, will give you this. Well, I'm sorry, the previous block before one was nothing, so we put zeros in there. Um, but that, that'll give you this hash, 0, 0, 0, 1, 5, 7. Now, notice how it says previous hash in the next, in block number two. Well, that's the same number, right? 0, 0, 0, 1, 5, 7, 8, 3, B. Yep, same number. So when you hash that previous hash with that nonce and that block number, um, you'll get um, the hash of that block. Um, so the block number is two, the um, previous number is that 000157, and if you click mining, um, the, the first number that will get you a hash of that block that starts with four zeros is that one, it is 35230 in the nonce. So if I added some information here, then I w that would no longer be true. I'll just say like A, um, well, It'd be some action. B transfers uh, one coin to C. Find that block. Come on, please. It's thinking. Sometimes it takes a little while because the number is a little high. Uh, okay, there we go. So it changed the nonce to 186803, and now we've got um, a hash that at the bottom when taking all these previous things that starts with four zeros, and I've actually broken this one. So if I kind of rehash this, um, and the reason the reason I yeah, there we go. Okay, so so what this what this shows us basically is that um you can take by hashing the the hash of the previous block is one of the elements in the next block. We get this unbroken chain for message integrity all the way back. The four zeros is also kind of handy. Um, this, this is just a practical tip. When you're actually evaluating a block just with your eyes, let's say you want to go back and not just use a script or, or a cryptographer, but you just want to eyeball some transactions in a blockchain, being able to look at those four zeros and look across them is actually very handy. Um, if you were to then arbitrarily take a block and rehash it and see, you know, block 10 million and five that those zeros uh, apply, uh, that, that, that will tell you a great deal about the integrity of every previous block. And uh, if you glance a block and notice, oh, there's not four zeros in there, if that, if that was a proof of work, you immediately are on notice that you want to go back until you, so that you can see what hap, what happens. Um, if that ever happens to you, if you're ever just trying this at home, here's another pro tip. Um, the easiest way to do that is just to half them. So if you're at block 10 million and four, go back to block 500,002 
and see is, is it accurate or not inaccurate there. If it's accurate there and you know, okay, well, it was okay at that point, then go up 250,000 block, block by 750,001 or whatever the next thing is, try it there and you can very quickly pinpoint where the problem was by halving it in case you want to try that. Okay, so there's a blockchain. And then here's the concept that is um, touted a lot with blockchain technology, which is the distributed part. So here it's the same thing. We've got this block, but we've actually got a copy of the same chain in several places. Um, and so what, so what this represents, I'm not going to uh, belabor it, so much that I actually put the transactions in and hash them across the three blocks, but you can try this at home. It's embedded in our website. You can also fork it in GitHub and install it yourself and interrogate the code, make sure it's right. As we, were, as we demonstrated, like people make mistakes. So if the math is wrong, let us know. And like do a pull request in GitHub so that we can fix it, but I'm pretty sure this is right. It's been out for a few years and no one's broken it yet. Um, so what this does is uh, this represents in a simplified, streamlined way, that you've got a bunch of people playing the role of miners and they're all given blocks to try to solve by doing their mining. And if you can tell that say, I think we put three here or Anders who coded this, put three there, an MIT guy. Um, if, if they all agree, if two of them agree that this is the hash and one of them disagrees, they, they have something different we could um, you could imagine a kind of governance mechanism where you say well we'll go with the majority like we, whichever blockchain information two out of three of the miners agrees is accurate we can write a script or create a, a system that will um imbue that blockchain as being the official authoritative blockchain which will then clear and replicate through all the nodes if you have a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand miners um, you know, this becomes much more probably true. You can also go back and individually, you know, run the math yourself if you want to check the integrity, see if there's been what's called a 51% attack, um, where you've got, you know, the majority of miners uh, conspiring or colluding in some way to, um, to change the history of the, uh, of the chain. Um, you could check that, but the thinking is when you get enough people involved, um, you can very quickly apply a so-called consensus algorithm to just establish which one of these changes is accurate. Um, and um, that's the idea of distributing. So there's two concepts of distribution here. One of them is distributing the role of miners so that there's a lot of theoretically neutral third parties that are doing this, or, or purportedly, or we'll assert that. And then number two, it's distributed in the sense that every node on the blockchain has a copy of the then most current blockchain so that anybody can go back and look at the history of the transactions. This is very helpful because you, you know, some of you that are astute or kind of doubting Thomas's might have been wondering, hmm, if you apply that hash algorithm that I was talking about on Monday and then on Tuesday you do it again, how do you know that Daza didn't on Tuesday just send me a different hash algorithm and say this is what I did on Monday? Right? That would be a that would be the number one attack vector for a hash. You have to sort of somehow preserve, create and preserve the right kind of evidence and like timestamp it in some way about what, what the hash was when it was initially applied so that you know later that the data hasn't changed because the hash hasn't changed. Um, and so in some way, one way to look at this, we've almost sort of punted on the data thing by Instead of showing the data hasn't changed, we have to show the hash that hasn't changed. Well, the hash is data too. It's just a little bit of data. It doesn't make the requirement go away of uh, making sure that you've locked it down. You know, one simple way to lock it down, uh, when I first learned about this stuff in the 90s, uh, is you, we, you could, um, back when we had microfiche and libraries and paper newspapers, um, one, of, one kind of practice was you could take the hash or a hash tree and spend like 20 bucks in the New York Times and the you know, what's the Toronto paper? The which one? Global Mail, um, the, you know, the, the LA Times, the Chicago Tribune, you know, China, anywhere, and just basically print the hash in there. And then anybody that was wondering, hmm, was this the hash at that given time can go in any library in the world that had microfiche of those newspapers and 
and could tell. If you went to two or three libraries, you'd then be in a situation of thinking, well, are all the librarians conspiring against me as well? Um, so another way to do that is, um, that is cumbersome, uh, is, is to um, do it all online and to create this layer of a blockchain that is, um, that's copied to everybody, every node. It sort of accomplishes the same thing, right? So does that, does that make sense so far, what I've said? Sir, oh, do we need the, I'll, I'll repeat your question, go ahead. That's a little bit out of my um, my expertise. And the question was how do mining pools work? But at a very high level, as I understand it, um, the game, so let's back up one step on the mining thing. I, I just mentioned miners and I showed you some, some of the computation they do. But there's an existential question, which is why would anybody take their time doing computation of hashes, like you know, for the fun of it, or they're really bored, or why? Um, so there has to be some incentive of some kind. Um, so the incentive within the, the initial, I would say like almost inspired idea from uh, Bitcoin was well, we could incentivize them by um, basically minting a certain amount of, block, uh, of uh, Bitcoins um, and then allocating some Bitcoin as a reward to the miner that was the first to achieve the correct result, basically you know, the nonce in the computation. So that's partly so, and then, and the hope was that somebody somehow or people somewhere would would ascribe value to these bitcoins um, and uh, would start using them like currency. Um, that panned out very well, I think, for Bitcoin. You know, there is a, a minority of people, um, and it, you know, I don't think we could call it legal tender yet, but there are people that do ascribe value to Bitcoin. And now there's exchanges and there's people who can pay for some things with Bitcoin. So the idea, I think, has been validated in practice. And uh, now those miners have an, a real incentive uh, to get those Bitcoins uh, by, by doing this process. So now we ask, uh, now we come to the, the question, which is, um, what, how do they do that? And what is a mining pool? Well, the more computational power you can deploy against this, um, this math question, the more likely you are to be the first to achieve the answer by pooling your computational resources with with others that have you know more CPUs and GPUs, um, you may have a better chance to find the answer first. There's other things too. People have tricks and um, you know little mathematical hacks and um, and formula that they do to try to. Um, be first. And so it's not just about computational power. It's also there's a little bit of tradecraft involved, and you might increase your practices in tradecraft um, by pooling with others as well. So that was at one point people talked about that. But I think the basic, as I understand it, the basic economic answer to why a pool of miners is to is basically to aggregate computational power. The question was, do they function as one node or are they separate nodes? And I can honestly tell you, I haven't any idea. I'm sorry. It's, I'm like, this is, I'm a little outside of my, uh, my competence to talk about that. Yes, sir? Oh, can you, can you clap the mic or hand him the mic, please? Um, so we have um, some knowledge from the audience. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
What was the answer? <laughs> like one node or more, more than one node. I'm not sure if I'm following, sorry. So your example, let's say, A is point one. Sure. And then that generates coverage in all. Sort of. Which then allows the, the four zeros and the uh, proper block. Yes. What I'm, what I'm curious is if somebody was to take that block number, Okay, let me, don't go away yet. Uh, let me, there's two things that occur to me as you're speaking. Um, and I think we might need one more round of back and forth to get to the, to the root of it. Um, one thing is there's an important property of hash algorithms that, uh, of SHA-256 and MD5 and all basic hash algorithms that, that I didn't mention, but it comes up with what you're saying with reverse engineering. And that's, that is that the, these hash algorithms are called one-way hashes. And when I stress that the the um, string it remains the same uh, number of you know digits each time that's connected to it. So it's actually, as I understand it, all but impossible to reverse engineer what data could have resulted in that in that string. Um, you would have to try every combination of data in the world in a way. So I'll try this blog post. I'll try that at will. You know, I'll try my my um, uncle's diary. Like. <laughs> It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and so it's um, difficult to reverse engineer from the hash what the data was, and that's a really great property of it. There's a second little thing, which is um, that was sort of maybe on the edges of what you were saying, which is, is it possible you could have had two totally different inputs to create the same hash output? And um, I wish I could tell you that was impossible, but I can't. Uh, and there's actually, I don't have it linked here, but if you ask me at the break, um, I'll, I'll find it and give it to you. Uh, but there's, um, when people discover what are, these are called hash collisions, um, there's like a, a place where, where you can report it. And uh, there's people that are fascinated by this because it's so unlikely mathematically. But I can tell you it's computationally infeasible that there's a hash collision. But statistically, that does happen very rarely. And when when it's when one is noticed, it's a big deal, and there's high fives all around, and um, and you know, and it gets added to this list, and you know, it will continue to happen. But I'm not aware of any block um, which which are actually identified by the by that unique number, the hash. It's, you don't really go back and find block 256 and block 312. Actually, everything's identified by the hash. Um, any of the, I'm unaware that any of those have ever been discovered to be on the collision list. One other thing I'll say, as you're, it, I think is also sort of part of the question that you're asking, which is um, the connection between the hash block and the data in the block and the identities of the parties. So, like, you know, A sends to C and C sends to D. This is very important information uh, to get right and to be able to traceably verify when you, when the whole point is having a ledger that. Um, that's supposed to provide you with some information security and some reliability. Um, well, the identity of 
parties uh, and, uh, and devices and code on a blockchain is found in what we call a blockchain address. So when you get a blockchain wallet, for example, Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever, um, and you um, install and kind of run it, um, it creates a key pair and it actually has this little protocol handshake thing on the blockchain that it's um, connected to to create an address. And, they, and, and your address actually has um, your public key, so actually a hash of your public key um, that um, serves as your address. So the so if you actually tried to change the name of the party or assume the identity of the party, say, well, I'm at, my name is B, like that should be my money. Um, one of the great things about the architectural um, building block of public key cryptography, this dual key cryptography, is that B, if they have done a good job at keeping their private key private and not sharing it with other people, not allowing it to be stolen, can very quickly prove I am B. And the way they can do that is you can send them some data, you can encrypt it with their public key, only they should be able to decrypt it. Or you can ask, or you can send them some data and say encrypt it with your private key or digitally sign it. If it decrypts with your corresponding public key, we know that the per, that the part that party at least has the private key of um, that was uh, linked or you know attributable to uh, the blockchain address of uh, you know B or whomever, whatever the fact pattern is when someone's trying to forge or, um, uh, or um, fraudulently assume the identity of another party. So um, that's kind of handy, you know, connecting parties to, to key pairs is just really great information hygiene. Blockchain does that, so good for blockchain. Are, are we, did that kind of get at what you were saying? That's, I was hoping if I said enough things, one of them would answer what you wanted. Um, great, so I want to take a moment to, I, I accidentally mislinked um, one of the things in my slides. Let me just take one moment to find it because there's a nifty little table that I showed to Amy and she said, oh, you got to show them that table. So let me just find that. It's in one of the versions of the blockchain briefing. One moment. So everybody think about questions or problems or ideas. One moment. Are you thinking? October is later than May. Oh, good. Okay. Yay. Um, so, first of all, credit where credit's due. Um, I, I, one of my clients is in General Electric um, legal department. I think they're great. Uh, and. Uh, well, this is not a commercial endorsement, but they've been great to work with. And one of the things that they've done, which has been helpful, is um, some of the research or other projects I'm helping them with, and it's basically application technology to their fairly large scale and complex practice of law. Um, they will, if it's not particularly a trade secret or competitive or anything like that, uh, confidential, uh, then uh, they'll let me put it under a Creative Commons license and just put it in a GitHub repo so other people could possibly you know, benefit from it. So uh, I don't know, think I put attribution to them here, but thank you, GE General Counsel's Office. Um, so this is the result of just a quick question that they had, which is kind of the same question that partly animates this program, which is, um, you know, what's blockchain good for? Um, like, why would we care as a legal department? People keep telling us we should care. Um, why exactly should we care? And so it's easy to say that in you know 50 pages of um, quizzical, ponderous text. Not so easy to say it in like really few concise words uh, that are as tight as, as the expectations of that office. And so um, we tried to do the latter uh, for this one. So one of the, um, one of the properties that, that seems to be a good fit, mic switch, uh, for is this on? Hello. Uh, for blockchain is uh, we can ask that we can pose a kind of a legal question. Does blockchain satisfy long-term record retention requirements? It seems like it could or should. I mentioned that stuff about message integrity. Well, does it? So um, we did a few permutations of this, but um, we looked at some requirements that were um, people were familiar with. Um, GE had a very big financial services um, operation in the day, 
and um, pulled some of the, in this case, uh, Code of Federal Regulations. And um, you can go here, uh, and I'll fix the link or get it to you through Amy or talk to me. But basically, we did a bit of an analysis of this. Um, and it looks like it could be very good at meeting some of those requirements. Right now, we use you know Iron Mountain, and we have to have a lot of practices and costs and overhead um, for establishing the integrity of records uh, for long-term retention. Um, and um, there may be a play here uh, for, by, to reduce some of that um, by, for example, every day that you add a bunch of stuff to your business archives, for example, or government archives, you could hash that and you could add it to a hash tree. You could enter that information onto a blockchain and, you know, that could be very, very handy in terms of um, if there's a question or dispute about whether these were, in fact, the records that you um, added to your archive on January 1st, you know, 19, uh, you know 2021, um, you could rehash that data, get the same hash and show, well, that was the block on that date that we entered it. It's computationally infeasible that the data has changed. This is the data in our archive, um, in fact, that we entered in that date. It doesn't tell you whether the data was accurate, whether there was fraud involved, at least locks down that part. And that's part of what people pay for with provenance and uh, chain of custody and everything else in these uh, services and what they stress, what, what we all stress ourselves when we're in-house. Are blockchain signatures enforceable? It, it should be admissible and enforceable in court as evidence. So we kind of looked at um, some of the underlying law in the U.S. and uh, uh, Code of Federal Regulations. And, um, and then this is partly what uh, animated that mock trial um, journey. Uh, but it looked to us like, yeah, they certainly would be. Um, they're a type of electronic signature. It's, it's an application of digital signatures with cryptography. And in, in fact, it seems to have um, some very um, relevant information security properties that you would like to have uh, when when introducing a signature, um, especially if you've done, taken that step of linking the legal party to a public key. If you've done that somehow through email, correspondence, contract, um, or otherwise, um, when it comes time to enter into evidence uh, a, a document that was purportedly signed by somebody with, with, uh, with a blockchain-based signature, well, you could, um, number one, uh, link the key to that party. Um, and number two, you could link this, the application of the private key to the thing that was signed uh, by basically re-signing it and seeing if you get the same value um, or, 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 or verifying it with a public key. And then number three, you can um, demonstrate, since the hash is part of uh, what's signed with a digital signature and, and um, inherent to the um, protocol that uh, by which every block is inscribed and every party conducts a transaction on blockchain, you can show that the data hasn't changed since, since the time it was signed. These are all handy things. It's like these are all steps along the way of you know, laying a foundation to enter something into evidence. So the answer there is like a qualified yes. The reason I'm saying qualified is when we duck into it later, I think I mentioned there's still a lot of traps for the unwary and a lot of practical issues uh, about laying that foundation in a way that's understandable and it's going to be effective. Um, it's not the, okay, well, okay. Well, let me go on to say a few more things. Um, are smart contracts enforceable as legal contracts? Um, okay, so we didn't finish that. So some of these are not um, finished and some of them are not necessarily cleared for public um, use yet. Uh, but um, let me just stop on that one for a moment and let's take a look at smart contracts. <laughs> I'm used to a Mac. So it's control T for a new tab? Yes, okay. Legalhackathon.org. So if you want to know about smart contracts, um, you can check out a recent um, legal hackathon that the MIT Media Lab um, ran. This particular one was looking at um, the music industry and um, how to um, what, uh, create, developing creative ideas that would give uh, composers and uh, musicians and other rights holders a better shake uh, in, with royalties and with being able to manage the digital assets that are their, that is their music and their songbooks. Um, so part of this involved blockchain, and if you scroll down on 
legalhackathon.org. We just did this last month. Um, you'll see I did a series of, um, here we go, a series of um, demos, basically, and, um, and tutorials on uh, four, block, four blockchain smart contract systems to look at um, whether traditional license arrangement or, or um, um, co-author or basically um, more than one composer um, kind of contract, uh, how those look, and, and how we could um, express those through smart contracts. It turns out smart contracts are really well suited to some of those terms. There's a lot of formulas, for example, involved in the allocation of royalties. And, and in tracking, it could be very good as well because the forensic evidence that's accumulated as you conduct transactions on the blockchain. Um, and just as a spoiler alert, there's a bunch of stuff that is appears to have like nothing to do with the blockchain. Like you just have to write out the indemnification. There's a bunch of stuff that occurs that, where there's no equivalent or there's no comparable way to express it or to effectuate the terms on blockchain. Those are the legal terms, you know, but some of the legal terms that relate to, um, you know, if then statements and, um, you know, formulas for allocation and even like creating and preserving evidence that somebody in fact was paid if they, if you're paying them in cryptocurrency, it's dead easy. But if you paid them off chain, say in Canadian dollars and they've you know, acknowledge payment and you've entered their acknowledgement onto the blockchain, you know, you can kind of get there. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that actually was a pretty good fit. So anyway, uh, we use our chain, um, which is a, a nice blockchain. Um, and here's a tutorial of how to do that and how to create the terms and use their language. We use Monax, uh, which uses uh, Tendermint and, and a new thing called Blackstone. Um, this is another um, open source um, company, uh, or I'm sorry, it's open source code. Um, for creating smart contracts. And this one's interesting because it also uh, applies something called BPN2, which is a business, um, uh, it's basically a, a business modeling language. So you can, uh, you can start to express some, of, some business rules, which is important. Um, and there's a little tutorial there. We have a wiki page with them, um, you know, how to install, config, and run it. And, uh, and then the last two I want to focus on a little more open law is a con so-called consensus spoke. Um, I want to get it just right. There, okay. Open law is a consensus spoke. Um, just quick question. Uh, who, who here has um, heard of, uh, who here has heard of consensus? Uh, the company. One, two, so just a smattering. So, um, so some of what I think you ought to know uh, as a result of this is, you know, some of the names. So partly so you can be um, more conversant and when it comes up with clients or out there in the world, um, you have some background. Consensus is an important player on the Ethereum blockchain. And Ethereum and Bitcoin are the two big blockchains. It's a, um, hard to describe as a company, but basically they, um, they incubate and launch lots of little companies that, will, that, um, that provide some interesting project or business that can operate on the Ethereum blockchain. So they, uh, in 2016, um, we did a blockchain and law um, workshop and consensus sent some people for one of our exercises. Uh, and it was from a company called Boardroom. And they basically built an app um, that um, applied smart contracts to like the, uh, the, the legal processes involved for like a secretary of a corporation. Um, so, you know, you take the minutes, you sign the minutes, you, and there's a board motion, you, you know, there's a process for that. And there's, you know, parliamentary thing, various things that you do. Um, they were able to, I think, quite successfully model those in, under the laws of Delaware and, um, and have them occur through smart contracts um, and um, using the Ethereum uh, mainnet. That was very interesting. They've got a bunch of other companies. Um, Uport is the identity one uh, spoke of consensus that's um, basically going to town, okay, with uh, with the digital signatures and and um, uh, and providing people more ways to do click-throughs and consent and more some privacy-enhancing things. So anyway, Open Law is uh, is the, is a consensus spoke for law and blockchain, and they've got a bunch of templates for smart contracts using the Solidity smart contract language. And um, this demo here shows a um, royalty. 
basically a royalty agreement. Um, so you can sort of fill out some standard terms, and um, and if you, in this case, the assumption is that the music is sort of on a blockchain, and the and the transactions are occurring with cryptocurrency. So if you're willing to go there, you can actually see how um, you know there's a pay per use kind of approach, and they basically have instantiated the whole thing. Another one that I encourage you to take a look at is called the Accord Project. Um, and uh, this one is really great. I've been working with them a lot. I'm going to be doing that more in the future. Uh, they've got a whole open source ecology for um, template-driven um, standard contracts um, that are expressed largely um, through smart contracts. Uh, and basically, Open Law and the Accord Project and Monax have all embraced um, this concept that I referred to earlier as dual integration. So you know, this, the legal contracts aren't going away. We can maybe uh, extend or or um, or partly express the the legal contracts through smart contracts on a blockchain. How do we make sure these things are very tightly connected? Um, these companies have different ways, but very good ways to do that. And in the in the drafting um, DAW, in the drafting uh, sort of developer environment or legal crafter environment, maybe of the near future. On one side, they will have a pane of the legal contract, and on the other side, they'll have a pane of the smart contract, like a, a display pane. And you actually kind of literally clause by clause see how they're linked and change some things on one side and update things on the other side. Like that's sort of the um, the gold standard of dual integration right from the drafting phase, and then um, makes it in very easier to track and monitor and manage you know the contract life cycle thereafter. Mind you, I just wanted to make one thing really clear because the way some of you are looking is, wow, I got to really get into this. So this is good stuff and you should learn about it. This is not ready for, most of this is not really ready for prime time yet. So it's like, this is not like switch your practice tomorrow, but do be aware of this stuff. And there will be times in clients and situations increasingly where this could be a good fit. Minimally, you, you ought to be aware of it, which is I think why you're in the room. Okay, so since there's only like four minutes left, um, let me take a pause right now and ask um, if there's any questions or, or ideas about any of that. Comments? Sir. Going back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So basically, was there, is there a way to date and timestamp um, transactions? And the answer is yes. Um, and there's, in general, there's a way um, because I have to go back and think uh, about the, the data elements in each block, but I believe there is a date and timestamp of when it was added to the blockchain, like in, in it itself. But also, you could ask anybody with a node and ask you know, three or four people, and it's quite likely true. Like, let's look at the logs and see when was this, when was this version accurate. And you know, there's a little bit of drift on people's computers and servers, but there's lots of ways to show that a server was within usually like you know, milliseconds of accurate uh, of the accurate time when a, when a given thing happens. But there's a deeper question in what you're saying, which is if part of what's so valuable about blockchain is being able to lock down uh, that a given thing happened at a given time, then how do we really do that? And why isn't that featured? Well, in my view, first of all, I think that is important for the law. This one of the capabilities of blockchain that's a, a direct match for legal requirements is this date and time stamping capability. Um, and there's um, a number of other, there's a number of companies that are now really embracing that. The first one that comes to mind, and I think they were the first to deploy at scale, is called Factum. Uh, Factum, F-A-C-T-O-M, I believe. And their whole claim to fame is you, you give them any arbitrary data, and they'll basically date and timestamp it and put it onto uh, their blockchain version. That's kind of the block, Bitcoin and Ethereum are really tuned to this presumed use case that, that people really, first and foremost, want to exchange cryptocurrency. That's not what most of my clients really first and foremost want to do. 
you'll hear a lot more about this tomorrow, but we do want to do things like date and timestamp things. Okay? And so Factum directly provides a service for that. There's several other services as well that will um, provide a date and timestamp service layer for blockchain transactions and give you back something very easy and usually a PDF version of it as well for your records that includes the hash of the thing and the, the date and the time. Um, so there's a, did that sort of answer your question? Okay, you're welcome. Um, any other um, thoughts, ideas? Okay, we have time for one more. I can talk all day. Um, so, I mean, what? So, I think that's great. Why don't we talk? And, and, and if it happens that no one has any questions and there's time left, I'm sure people would love the framework. It's a nice framework, sir. Hi. Uh, you observed earlier that there are certain problems with the contracts that will be available for reference contracts. Yeah. Um, what are the extended conditions? Mm -hmm. um, are we just not there yet? Do you see a future mm -hmm. Wow, um, that's a nice question. Um, so that could be a day right there. So the question, if I understood you correctly, was um, given my observation that we discovered a number of terms, and so most terms were not expressible in smart contract languages as they exist today, could I envision a time in the future when um, those terms, or, or all of some terms in some given case maybe, would be expressible? And the answer is yes, um, I can. Um, and and um, here's how. So number one, um, one way to sort of, I'm just gonna hack the question first. Which we love doing, MIT is a hacker school, and I mean that in the best sense of the word. Uh, we like to build things that are improbable. Um, and so uh, first of all, you could, if you were up for it, you could parse all the contracts you have, or you could do a web, search for contracts that only include things that are directly expressible in the little subset of things that you can do in Solidity. So we could do it today. I have done it just to see if I could. Um, but that doesn't really scratch the edge because the, the emphasis of your question was more, when would, it, when would there be a general expression language um, that could capture like a lot of contracts? And you specifically mentioned IP. Okay, so IP is upping the ante. There's a lot of clauses you want to have in an IP contract, depending on what it is. And um, that is not covered by my little hacky example. So I'd say there's like a, um, there's a progression to keep in mind. And I'm going to, I'll just sort of lay it out. One thing is um, being able to instantiate the terms in a way that I'll call machine readable. Okay. So I'm dealing with a client right now um, where they've got one part of their business is doing, I'm sure how much I should say, um, doing stuff, um, and there's a lot of um, a lot of the stuff with contracts um, are, are scanned images of the contract. Is it digital? Yes, it's digital. Is it machine readable? Hell no. And so, like right now, my laptop at some point just to bust through me and other fairly senior people and other people are literally taking sacks of those and we just allocated like 100 or 200 to each of us and on airplanes and stuff, we are just typing the relevant um, data from each contract which uh, into, a, into a database so that we can do some of the analytics we wanna do. The next thing is machine readable. And so, you know, if, all, if at least it's in, not even Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word seems to be machine readable, not really. Um, PDF, not really. There's, you have to go through layers to extract the data. Machine readable, just think um, like the encoding, UTF-8 encoding for our civilization. And, and pure text with like structural things like XML or JSON. So you can just very quick, so you could write a script to go to a part of the contract and, 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 and test something. Like, see, does this word exist or what is this threshold? Like, what is the amount of indemnification? What is the you know, what is the condition? So you want to encode it as data. You want to actually treat the contract like data. 
And if you want to treat it nicely, you're going to express it um, in a structured text, UTF-8 encoded, and you want to document it. So like if it's XML, make sure people know the schema so that they can write their scripts and, and do stuff with it and process it. That's machine readable. Machine readable is like miles and miles and miles away from the smart contract feature you're talking about. And I think that's the next journey for the law. It's just machine readability. The next thing I would say is that applying some automation. So document assembly um, or, um, or, or better contract management. Um, so now we're writing scripts and we have systems and processes and applications that can kind of you know, manage the contracts and maybe you apply a DocuSign service at a certain life cycle point. Maybe you have a trigger where you can go and in an automated way when the contract's going to expire for a certain segment of your customers or business partners to send to trigger some salesperson to go and make a call. You know, like these would be examples of more automation applied to contracts. Um, so now, uh, and then the final kind of uh, step on that um, stack would be autonomous systems. And that's sort of the dream of these uh, contract of these uh, blockchain smart contracts is to have more um, operations and transactions occurring without human review or approval. Um, okay, that's a much, that's miles and miles and miles further. And there's questions about the desirability and the prudence of doing that, you know, in terms of risk management and common sense. Um, but um, but um, for some things, I could imagine that happening sooner than later. Um, so uh, I've been getting some good mileage lately looking at like traffic and parking codes. It's, not, it's a different type of law, but these are things where, you know, with Internet of things and increasing use of autonomous vehicles or, or more automated systems on board, where you actually can go a great deal of the way toward taking these chunks of what's in the code, expressing it in a way that, um, you know, a navigation app could understand and could start to layer on some traffic rules um, and, and where is their parking and, you know, um, you know ticklers for, for, or, um, or notices, and trigger events, things like that. Taxes could be another one. You know, the tax code could be expressed initially in ways where there's parameters and thresholds so that your QuickBooks and other accounting systems and audit systems could actually allow for, number one, automate machine readability and automation without a bunch of humans sweating the details and trying to transfigure it into something that your systems can support and reflect, but it could be more directly integrated. And inevitably, more autonomous things will happen. And the question of where do you want to have human review and approval um, becomes much bigger then. Uh, but, um, you know, I would say uh, we're a long, long way uh, from having uh, the, the, the pure vision of um, autonomous um, transactions occurring uh, in this sort of um, layer of a, of a distributed autonomous um, organization or corporation or, or sets of systems of corporations um, um, operating um, um, and being able to express all of the things that we would want them to express just as a, as a, um, just as a direct matter of like, um, uh, what would I call it, like crosswalking or like directly linking everything you'd want to say in a contract to the rights expression languages, which are very primitive right now, and to some of the other types of ways of expressing business rules and legal things. But the, but the big question underlying that is how much should we do? Um, and what is the role of the lawyer uh, in, the, in the emerging age of more autonomous and automated systems? And um, how, how, how clued in do we need to be um, to uh, be able to look at the systems ourselves and kind of crack open the hood and start to tinker or understand what the interdependencies were and you know reverse uh you know what happened to get us to this point and when do we want to build in human I'll just use the phrase one more time human review and approval um there's one other thing i would just say which is um ai this is about blockchain but ai is sort of like <laughs> it's like imagine it's right next to us as we're talking about blockchain um there's deeper questions i think for the bar um we'll get to in the fullness of time about, for example, uh, ethics and even our professional rules of ethics. So as we start to rely more and more on systems that are doing things in an, that been, where, where we did our best on day one to express every, you mentioned like every variation of a situation. Um, uh, but now we come to day, you know, one plus whatever, and there's a dispute or something's happened. 
and we need to take a look at it, or, or, or even on day one, we want to ask ourselves, how well have we done at uh, our job of, um, let's say, um, being a, a, an advocate for the client's interests, a fiduciary duty? Well, you, you need to understand when terms are happening in an automated way and when um, decisions and you know, weighted weights and priorities and goals, which are embedded sometimes deep, deep, deep in these machine learning based and other AI based systems, you want to understand what were all of the training sets and what were the assumptions that people had. And do those accurately reflect and support the priorities and the, the goals of, of your client? So if you're using AI systems as part of the practice of law, um, this is one of the sorts of things that lawyers will have to get good at, or they'll have to be somewhere in the bar within the practice of law and the regulation of law where someone's good at that and can begin to evaluate um, some of these deeper questions so we can do our job and we can spot in appropriately and know that we're doing the right thing and that could be measurable. Does that kind of answer your... Uh, what did I miss? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I should have said that. <laughs> it can be done one day, and the question should be done. And on it can be done. You know, I, I'd say I've got like a, I don't know, like a sixty, seventy percent confidence rating on that statement because. Some things that we express in law, so contracts, is, contracts are infinitely permeable. They're infinitely configurable to whatever private parties want to contract about. Some of these things can be inherently subjective. Um, and then if you get to other areas of law where we're talking about our values and principles and things, you know, I don't know. It's hard for me to foresee right now when we'd have a machine language that could completely capture these things, which are more akin to... I don't know, poetry um, than they are to, um, you know, um, um, uh, objective, um, measurable, um, like math. So I think some stuff may actually and very appropriately be beyond capture um, when we get to constitutional things, questions of sovereignty, which we'll get to later, um, you know, some other human rights, some human rights things may just not be, ex I'm just not aware of how one would express some of that very fuzzy stuff. But for most of the stuff that would feature your question, I think it's inevitable that we'll, we'll get there and we'll be capable of expressing um, more you know, kind of transactional and mathy and objective kinds of things. And, um, and we'll, we'll want to make sure that everyone in the life cycle is ready for that, that the legislatures, the regulators, the practitioners, the clients, people are really in sync with that and, uh, and doing it sort of the, in a standard the same way. And we're able to have serious discussions about what the, what the rules should be and what the consequences will be and who bears the risk of loss and who has what burdens and responsibilities as a result of expressing these things. Sometimes, actually, this stuff brings up stuff that we hadn't thought about before. Um, when you start coding things explicitly, you can <laughs> it raises a lot of questions which were implied or which were you know, maybe deliberately ambiguous before, but now you, know, you have to code it when everything's happening in the machine. So those are some reflections on your question. Is that it? Okay, good. Got a clean yes, so let's consider that asked and answered. Any other um, questions, thoughts, ideas, opinions, aspirations, sir? Uh, kind of a question, but what sort of expertise do you need to bring on in legal teams to deal with smart contracts? <laughs> <laughs> it's huge. Um, you know, a lot of these are now written in. Stay right there, <laughs> please. Um, so the question was, um, you know, what would be the nature of the role? Well, like who would be on the teams? Uh, and in particular, we're looking at the legal dimension of the team when we're expressing these legal instruments and legal processes. Conflict. Dispute resolution and conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, so A number one, I would see all your smiling faces. Um, and so, I mean, this is going to be our job in the future uh, as lawyers, those of you who are attorneys um, and regulators and lawmakers, um, will have to, like this will be the nature of our job. When the clients are 
doing these transactions in this system and legal questions arise like dispute resolution, who are you going to call? All of us. And so uh, we need to get educated um, about this and be uh, somewhat ahead of the state of the art. Now let me go one level deeper and say, okay, well, what would be the job description? What would be the skill set, right? What would be like the behaviors and activities and tasks um, that a person playing that role of providing legal advice on a team, uh, what would they have? You know, what, what, what would they exhibit? That is an active question, uh, you know, for me. Um, and um, one of the things, uh, so let me just say a few things. Um, let me, but the first one is a question. Who here has heard of regex, regular expressions? One, two, okay. We got, we have our work cut out for us. Um, so I think like the first thing that would be great for um, people providing the role of legal counsel um, to um, parties that are, that are um, designing and, and operating these kinds of systems um, would be a proficiency with data and a proficiency with um, like apps, data and apps. By that, I don't mean everyone needs to know how to code in a computer language like you know, Python or C++. I think that's somewhat beyond what is necessary and it's also somewhat to the side of what's necessary. Uh, but there are some things that you would need to know. Um, so one thing I would say is if you're, when you're re regular, actually, can you explain regular expressions? Exactly. So maybe you kind of know, ah, well, like the, C the social security number, is that the example you gave? Um, social insurance number, excuse me. Is, like I know the ones I'm looking for start with 115782, but I need to now just segment this big pile of data from discovery or from what I'm just trying to understand a, a deal and I want to sub-segment things. You can't, it's not easy to do that um, with find and, re like find and replace are real good. I know we're all good at that, but you can go a little, you can and must go a little further and be able to be proficient, have some basic proficiency in interrogating data and regular expressions are A number one. You can do it on any computer and you can do actually remarkably, I'd say astonishingly complex um, searches and you can uh, to take some actions with regular expressions. Like you can take all of those things and put them to the top of a of like a list, or you can do lots of good things. You can basically start to be a little bit of a, like a magician with data. Uh, well, in, law is an information intensive profession. So we need to be good at dealing with a lot of information beyond the document paradigm of, you know, I know we all know how to speed read and we know how to like go through a box of documents and strip mine it pretty quick for things. But as it, when it's digital, we need to apply, we need to, Learn slightly different skills in order to stay current, in order to keep up, and uh, in order to do our job as lawyers. And I'd say the A number one thing would be people on that team that you're asking about in the, in the future, right now, in some companies I'm working with, Silicon Valley and in London, some other places, there already are lawyers that are very good at this. Like, it put me to shame. My skills are quite primitive, and they're doing a really good job. It's like in house counsel and external counsel, but everybody should have just basic proficiency with regular expressions would be like the first building block. Um, there's a few other things I think that we could expect to see as well, which is um, I'm just being able to do like a swim lane diagram, um, which is like a very basic, simple engineering kind of idea. Um, so now we're looking at, um, when you're looking at systems that have been engineered, we need to understand them. You don't have to be a patent attorney to do what I'm talking about, but um, this is a way where you can Actually, I think I added it to the slides. One minute. Okay, I will not dig from the slide. Uh, but basically, um, it's a way where you can do role separation. So you can say like buyer, seller, distributor, channel partner, whatever. And then those, like let's say, go up and down. And then like row by row, you can say like, okay, like the first thing is like, you know, buyer inquires price or asks for a quote from seller. 
And now seller does like provides a quote and then buyer does this, the seller does that. And then it goes to the channel partner that provides the shipping terms or whatever the distribution partner. And you can actually sort of like capture and understand in a simple diagrammatic way, a very deep amount of information about the behavior and the sequence and the entity relationships and even very complex systems. So getting good at things like asking the lawyer kind of questions, but then expressing it in like swim lane diagrams and other simple engineering diagrammatic ways would be a second kind of behavior or skill I would expect from that team. I could go on and on and on about this one, but um, I see that we're out of time. I'm going to be around all day and I'm sticking around tomorrow too, and I'd be happy to talk about skills for lawyers that want to get good at data and uh, what our roles could be in the future at length with you, including, are we doing drinks tonight or something? Including tonight. I get very loquacious when alcohol is added. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you.